title of this sermon is The Unspoken Sin, in quotation marks. And I want to talk to you about something today that I'm assuming every single man in here has struggled with at some point. Now, when I say men, I know a couple of you are jumping to a broad conclusion, lust, addiction, anger, the typical sins that we associate with men. And the women in the room are rejoicing. Finally, no conviction for me. All the convictions going to my husband today, he can finally get told what to do and I don't have to carry the weight anymore. But here's the truth. I'm assuming that every woman in here has struggled with this as well. I could go so far to say that I believe every single person in here is struggling with this sin at some level in their lives. Most of you are probably thinking you've got it now. It's got to be false idol worship. It's got to be it. Everyone struggles with that. It's got to be jealousy or greed. Now, all these things I mentioned are important sins that should be spoken about in church. That's not what the Lord has put on my heart to speak about you guys today. The topic I want to discuss with you guys today is something that has basically been swept under the rug, in my opinion, in the church today. It's one of those things we ignore. We ignore it completely and hope it'll go away, pray it away, pray it'll go away forever, and we don't speak about it. That's why I labeled this the unspokable sin. The quotes are important because I see this thing as not a sin, but as a blessing in disguise if used correctly. And the topic I'm discussing with you today is doubt. Doubt is the unspoken sin in all of our lives in this room. Doubt is difficult to communicate because doubt is less like the roaring lion of lust or pride or addiction that we're used to. Doubt is more like a slow seeping venom that if treated correctly, we can get rid of. And manage, but if untreated and unspoken about, will eventually kill us. Not only us, it'll kill our families, it'll kill our friends, and it'll kill our spiritual walk with Christ. Doubt is deadly if not used correctly. So there's a story in the Bible that I think articulates this beautifully, a book in the Bible that articulates this beautifully. Sorry, first time speaking, I'm gonna stumble over my words a little bit. That's okay though. Um, if you please turn in your Bibles to the book of Habakkuk. Book of Habakkuk. It's in the Old Testament, right before the Gospels. It's only three chapters, so don't scoot by it. You might miss it. So the book of Habakkuk is one of my favorite books in the entire Bible. It is only three chapters long, but speaks some incredible truth that I think is essential for a walk with Christ. So I highly encourage you, after today, go and read Habakkuk on your own. Add it to your Bible study. It'll take you maybe 20 minutes to read, and it is a phenomenal book. So Habakkuk is not the name of a new healthy soft drink you've never heard of or a town in some country you've never been to. Habakkuk is the name of a minor prophet in the Old Testament. So if you don't know, there's 12 books in the Old Testament. These are called the minor prophets. They're named after individual prophets God sent to his people to speak on his behalf. The prophets had one primary job, to proclaim God's message to God's people to remind them of the promises and commands of God and to warn them of the consequences of of rebelling against God. And newsflash, the Israelites, who were God's chosen people, they really sucked at this. They were horrible. They never found God's command. They they broke it all the time. They just did whatever they want all the time. Sounds very familiar, doesn't it? Um, (laughs) This is why they needed so many prophets to keep them in order, and this is why they're in constant need of rescue, which sounds a lot like my walk with Christ. I'm in constant need of rescue, and I need constant reminder of Jesus' goodness. So our prophet Habakkuk enters the scene at a real chaotic time. The Israelites are worse than they've ever been, and the Babylonians are about to take them over. And so Habakkuk does what he does best, and he goes to God. Now, most prophets, they usually prophesy to the Israelites directly, but Habakkuk is the only one who goes directly to God. According to scripture, we have no reference to him direct, directly communicating to the Israelites. He only addresses God with his concerns. And this is a genre of the Bible called lament. And I think lament is extremely important. You should look into it. It takes place in the book of Psalms, in the book of Proverbs. There's an entire book in the Bible called Lamentations, which is Greek for lament. Right, Dad? You have a doctorate. <laughs> um, We're going to start in chapter 1 today, starting in verse 1. All right, here we go. This is the message that the prophet Habakkuk received in a vision. How long, O Lord, must I call for help, but you do not listen? Violence is everywhere, I cry, but you do not come to save. 
Must I forever see these evil deeds? Why must I watch all this misery wherever I look? I see destruction and violence. I am surrounded by people who love to argue and fight. The law has become paralyzed and there is no justice in the courts. The wicked far outnumber the righteous so that justice has become perverted. So in, this opening ver- in these opening sections of verses, we see Habakkuk looking around at all the Israelites. He's seeing all the rape, the murder, the genocide, the stealing. And he's like, God, what's going on? I thought these were your chosen people. Why aren't they doing what you said, Lord? How long are you going to let this go on? And this is a type of doubt that we see a lot. This is called common doubt. Taking notes, common doubt. So common doubt is doubt that takes place outwardly. So we project it outwards. We see this a lot in things like genocide, um, racism. My mind just blinked. (laughs) Natural disasters, things like that. These are things that we don't have direct correlation to, but we still doubt God's goodness within them, okay? So we have outward projecting doubt called common doubt. In the second half of verse 2, we see the second type of doubt, and that's personal doubt. Personal doubt affects our personal walk with Christ and how we feel personally. It's inward focus. So we have outward focused and inward focused doubt, two types. And this handles things such as depression, mental illness, death in the family, addiction, truth of God, things like that. Both of these kinds of doubts affect us in drastically different ways, and they are both equally important and equally challenging to our walk with Christ. So before I get into how God responds to doubt, I want to expand on what doubt really is a little bit. So doubt is a really tricky thing to handle because for my entire life, I saw doubt as a sin. Like seven deadly sins, doubt was number eight. You don't question God, you don't question the church ever. And this was hard for me personally because when I would have questions or I would have doubts, I felt like I couldn't go anywhere. And I definitely couldn't go to church because they, were, they had it all figured out. I couldn't ask them a question. So this led me, I could honestly say that doubt is one of the things that led me to walk away from Christ. I haven't been saved my entire life. I got saved roughly three years ago at this point. I grew up a pastor's kid. I grew up in church, and I had doubts, and I had questions, but I felt as if I could not ask those questions. And it's nothing my dad did incorrectly. It's just the pressure of the church. Sometimes we sin, sometimes we fail, and that's okay because God is still good. But I felt as if those questions could never be asked and let alone ever be answered, and I would be judged for them. So I never brought them. And then they began to take seed in my heart and eventually destroy my walk with Christ. Now, luckily, I'm standing here today redeemed and restored, and that's good news. Um, So I see doubt differently now. I see doubt as this little tennis ball right here. This is doubt. Now, while I have doubt in my hand, I can handle it. I can toss it around. I can still hold my Bible. I can toss it to someone else, and they can handle it for me. Toss that back, Davis. Appreciate it. The important thing is while I'm handling doubt, while I'm handling it, I can still open up my Bible and fill my mind with truth, right? So I can still manage my doubt with hopes that eventually because of this, this will outweigh this and it can eventually go away until another one comes. But I'm already structured so I know what's going to happen. I'm going to go back to the word. I'm going to rest in the truth. The issue is when this does not go away, and we decide not to go to the Word, and we decide to let it intercede and sit, stay in our lives forever, this starts turning into this, and this, and this, and it just becomes piling and piling and piling up until you feel like you're choking. Now, I still have my scripture. Mike's falling off my ear. <laughs> I still have my scripture. I can still see the Word of God. I can still feel His presence, but... Unlike before when I only had one, maybe I stop going to church every single Sunday. Maybe I stop praying every morning. Maybe I, maybe I look at that video I'm not supposed to just one time. Maybe I have one little drink. What's it going to hurt? Now, this is not doubt anymore, guys. This is what we label as unbelief. And this is wrong. And when unbelief, if not handled correctly, you guessed it. We're just going to keep piling and keep piling and keep piling until eventually I have to sacrifice this. 
I can't, I can't manage this and this at the same time. It's impossible. I don't have the grasp. I don't have the handle because I'm so worried about this. It's causing me to hold on to this and become inward focused, right? I'm turning myself away from the word of God. I don't even know what is church at this point. When my unbelief becomes so strong, it begins taking roots and it begins growing until it's this big. I have to use both hands in order to handle all of this. I can't even think about church. I can't even think about going back to a prayer group. I can't think about worshiping because I'm so wrapped up in this that I can't even see that. So it's important we've lost sight of this and our doubt has become unbelief which has turned us to walk away from Christ completely. And when you get to this point, this is where the devil loves to work. He loves to work right here in the cracks. This is where things like addiction, sexual addiction, pornography addiction, alcoholism, drug and substance abuse, serious, serious things that we manage, this is where all that comes from. So I hope this is a clearer picture on what doubt really is and how it can transform your life into something bad. So we know that doubt exists and we know what it is. So let's talk about the people who struggle with it, which is... Everybody, all of us, every person in this room, if you were born, you struggle with doubt. Congratulations, aren't you happy to be alive? (laughs) So while there are people out there who are open or closed to their struggle with doubt, trying to find my verse, there we go, Um, there is another party, and it's those who deny doubt completely. They don't think it exists. They're like, Zach, that could never be me. I grew up in church, I've been in church my whole life, I've got the whole Bible memorized. I've got Psalm 23 on my coffee cup that I drink every single morning. I have never struggled with doubt ever. I am amazing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, let me run a quick lineup by you of people in Scripture who struggled with doubt. Moses, Abraham, Isaiah, Ezekiel, Noah, all 12 of the disciples, Paul, David, This is an all-star lineup, people who were closest with God, the people we read about in Scripture, and they doubted God at times. They doubted themselves. So I say that to say, it's okay to doubt. It's okay. It can be a good thing. And I have to ask you, why are you hiding it? Why are you hiding your doubt? You've been so busy convincing everyone around you that you have no doubt, you've gone as far as to convince yourself that you have no doubts. And you can hide it from everyone here on earth until the day you die. You cannot tell a soul. You can hide it from yourself. But there will come a time when you are going to stand at the pearly gates, face to face with the creator of the universe. And as you stand there, God's going to know. He's going to know your heart. He's going to know your mind. He's going to know everything that you've been thinking, even the things that you've been hiding from yourself, the things you didn't even know. And as you stand there, Hold on, lost my place in my notes. He knows you've been questioning him, questioning him. And there's going to come a time where God is going to have to be the placeholder between you and legalism. Now, legalism is where doubts learn to die. It's where they drown. This is where no questions happen. No questions are ever answered. This is where we have to be perfect Christians at all times. And this is you. And there's going to be a time in heaven where God is going to be the interceder. You're not going to be looking at legalism anymore. You're going to be looking at God. And he's going to look at you and he's going to embrace you because there's there's no placeholder anymore. You can't can't placehold it with things you're struggling with. You can't delay your doubt with things like alcohol or things like drugs or anything like that. That's not going to work because there will come a time when God is going to be face-to-face with you, your placeholder between you and the life that you are used to in legalism. So this moves me on how, oh, and when we have this placeholder, the good news is that God does not turn us away because that would be legalism, and we don't serve a God of legalism. We serve a God of glory. So when he's in this placeholder, he's going to embrace you and love you as his own, and he's going to take your questions, and he's going to say, my son, in whom I am well pleased, and he's going to embrace you. So this leads me into how God responds to our doubt. We can look at this in verses five, verse five. So the Lord replied, look around at the nations, look and be amazed, for I am doing something in your own day, something you wouldn't believe even if someone told you about it. I am raising up the Babylonians, a cruel and violent people. 
They will march across the world and conquer other lands. They are notorious for their cruelty and do whatever they like. Their horses are swifter than cheetahs and fiercer than wolves at dusk. Their charioteers are charged from far away. Like eagles, they swoop down to devour their prey. So Habakkuk brought his doubts to God, and Habakkuk received a response. But in verses 7 through 11, we see that Habakkuk is not happy with God's response because God's response to Habakkuk's outcry is not what he expected to hear from God. Habakkuk wasn't expecting for God to raise up the Babylonians to conquer Israel and defeat all the violence that they've been used to. First, he was upset at the lack of response from God, and now he's upset at the response from God. This is very common. God, why won't you answer me? God, why won't you answer me? Okay, here's your answer. God, that's not the answer I want. I want my answer. This is something I've struggled with for a long, long time. I'm not standing up here as a guy who's conquered doubt. I can tell you that much. I've been doubting myself as much as this week. As soon as God responds, and it's not the way we expect, we turn back to ourselves. We get back to this. We get back to our unbelief. We turn away from God, and we turn back to ourselves. God, I've got it. I, I can beat this doubt on my own. I can be, I don't need you anymore. You don't, you don't know what's best for me, God. Apparently not, because I don't think that's the best way for me. God may not answer the way you want, or how you want, or as quickly as you want, but I promise you, he will respond at some point. He will respond to you. Your job, our job, as believers, is to fight. Not based on our ability to understand, not based on our ability to answer questions, or understand every concept in the Bible so we have no doubts. Our job is to fight because of who Jesus is. That's our job, to fight for Jesus, to fight for what he's done. We need to stop putting our faith in the pro, pro, produce, pro, holy cow, okay. We need to stop putting our faith in the product, the thing that's gonna come from our doubt, and start putting our faith in the producer, the one who produces it, the one who produces the answer. You can't, you can't stand firm, you can't have a firm foundation like they just sang if you're putting your faith in the in-between instead of the answer. You may not know the answer, but you can trust God. God honors the fight. God honors the slow and dreadful crawl. He honors the moment when you look at him in desperation and say, God, I'm done. I'm done, you've got this. Whatever your will does, I'm here for. I wanna tell you guys something, something that I never had spoken to me but I wish I had, it is okay for you to doubt God. It is okay for you to not understand the circumstance or the why or the how. Listen to me, this is really important. Don't you dare doubt without him. You can't. You can't function without him. You can doubt his provisions. You can doubt his future plan for you. You can doubt if he's ever gonna heal you, but don't you dare doubt without him. Don't do it. You can't stand. You can't handle it. And that is great news. That takes the pressure off your shoulders and puts it on God. And the good news is God can handle it. He's done it before countless times over and over and over again. And you're not going to change his mind and you're not going to do anything different that he's not used to. Put your doubts on him. But also doubt him. Question him. Don't understand. And be okay with that. When you have your arms stretched out to the fullest extent and you're saying, why God? I don't understand God. Why me? There was a man who stood atop Calvary and stretched his arms across a wooden cross and said, because I love you as my own. Jesus died for our doubt. Not just our sins. He died for our sins, thank the Lord. But he also died for our doubt and the reasons we don't understand which is great news. Let me tell you that the answer to every doubt you're gonna face from now until the day you die and go to heaven is love. That's the answer. Not just your love, God's love, resting in God's love. 
Stop putting your trust in things that you don't know and put your trust in who you know. You may never receive the answers in the way you expect. You may be looking down the barrel of a hundred years of silence. There's a time in Scripture where Jesus went silent for 300 years. 300 years, not a peep. Their faith never wavered because they trusted in who they did, what they did know, which was that God loves them and God trusts them and God's here for them. You can rest in what you do know. Most doubt in Scripture and all of Scripture is rooted in, I won't believe until I see God. I won't believe until I see Doubting Thomas, one of the most famous stories in Scripture. God, I will not believe until I put my hands in the holes that Jesus was nailed to the cross with. I will not believe until I see. And how does Jesus respond? Come here, my son. Put, put your fingers in my holes and see what I've done for you. See what I've done for you so you don't have to doubt anymore. The man who stood atop Calvary and took a whip and was spat on and had thorns driven in his head, nails nailed into his arms and legs and bore the guilt of the entire world just so you can walk blindly has given you eyes to see through his love. Don't live in the lie. Stand in the truth. You will die in the lie and never see the truth if you let it kill you. This is so important. That's all I want from you guys, to live and not die in the lie. We need to be exactly like Habakkuk and bring our doubts to God. Ultimately, doubt is a sign of our fallenness as Christians. We are unable to trust God fully and completely because we, as humans, are broken. But Jesus is not broken and fallen. We do not overcome doubt by trying really hard to trust or taking an overcoming doubt seminar or going to church every single Sunday, which is important, go to church. Um, we overcome doubt by fixing our eyes on the one who was faithful to the end. The end. When he, stood atop, when he was hanged on the cross and he looked at God and he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When he felt as if the whole world had turned against him, he never doubted, not once. If Jesus never doubted, then we have even more of a reason to bring our doubts to him because he is holy and he is good and he is gracious and forgiving and loving and a million adjectives that I could describe the way that Jesus has loved me personally. I can't imagine the things you've walked through. I can't imagine the things you've been through, but I can't imagine that you've doubted him at some point in your life. And I tell you, when you fix your eyes on the cross, things begin to look a lot different. When we keep our eyes forward, we keep our eyes walking one direction, eventually we'll end up looking down, looking down at ourselves, looking down at those around us, looking down at God. But when we keep our eyes forward to what Christ has done, the provisions he has for us in the future, everything begins to change. We can see clearly. We can run to him. In Mark 9, we have a story that I believe articulates how we feel, deal with doubts perfectly. Jesus gets asked by this father of a demon-possessed child if Jesus has the ability to cast out his son's demons. And Jesus looks at him and he says, what do you mean if I can? Anything is possible if a person believes. And the father looks at Jesus and cries out, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. Such an important verse. If I could get that tattooed across my face and not be looked at weird, I would do it. <laughs> Lord, help my unbelief. Don't just take your sins to the altar. Bring your doubts as well. Say, Lord, I need help. I am broken. I don't know what I'm doing, but I trust you. Rest in the truth. Bring them directly to Christ. Not tomorrow. Not when you figure it out. Not when you can get a grip or listen to the right sermon. The time is now. Right now. Because I know there's someone out there and your doubt is suffocating you. And you don't know where to go. And you feel completely lost. And maybe you're like me as a child and you felt like your questions would never be answered. And you see the beginnings of your walk with Christ not being a steady pace anymore, but you're stumbling here and there and you're about to fall over. And that's when the devil's going to grab you. And you know the moment the devil grabs me, I'm never going to be back in that church ever again. This is why it's so important to bring your doubts now. 
and stand with all these believers in this room who would love to pray with you, and I guarantee you I've stood in your shoes. How many of you have dealt with doubt? Raise your hand. That is a lot of people. <laughs> so those of you who are struggling with doubt, you have a room full of believers, not just here, but anywhere. Go to any church and say, I am struggling. Be real. Be vulnerable. Because I don't want to stand at the gates of heaven and look across and my brother in Christ is not there because his doubts suffocated him until he died and went to hell. I don't want that. I want us to be standing in glory right in front of the eyes of the Father and him looking at us and saying, I know you've doubted me at times and not understood, but I am here and I'm faithful to the end, just like I was with my son when he died on the cross. I think this is so important for us. I just, this is something so personal to me, something I've dealt with for a long time. I, for those of you who know my story, I have severe anxiety. I was diagnosed a couple years ago. And when I was unsaved is when my anxiety was worse than it had ever been. There was a point in time where I threw up for my anxiety 156 days in a row. 156 days in a row. Sometimes multiple times. And there used to be times when I would sit on the bathroom floor on my knees and I said, God doesn't love me anymore. He doesn't love me anymore. He's done. He's done with me. And it took a lot of restoration and I still deal with anxiety. I'm not saying you're ever, you're going to deal with doubts until you die. But the good news is you can put your faith in the one who already died and rose again from the grave so that when you do die, you can say, I might have had doubts at times, but I trusted in the one who had it all figured out. Man, doubt, doubt, doubt. It is a killer. I'm just telling you, I still have anxiety. I still struggle with it. I take meds every single night, but I don't doubt God's provisions and God's faithfulness. If you had told me two years ago that I'd be standing right here preaching about doubt, I would have looked at you in the face like you were a fool. But God has a silly way of turning our deepest regrets into our biggest desires. My biggest regret is walking away from my faith because I doubted God for so long that it eventually killed me. Not physically, obviously I'm standing here, but spiritually, I was dead. I was dead. I just don't, I, I don't want that for you guys. I want you guys to be able to stand firm forever and not ever waver from your walk with Christ. And it starts with you doubting God, which sounds so wrong, but it's so right. So trust your doubts. Bring them to the altar. Bring them to your fellow brothers and sisters in Christ forever until the day we die and we stand in glory in heaven once again reunited with Christ.